Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. We are doing just the three of us today. Rolf Jacobson is on an, an All Saints vacation today when the, this podcast is, in fact, for All Saints Sunday, which falls on, believe it or not, November 1st, like it's supposed to. And the texts are Revelation 7, 9 through 17, Psalm 34, 1 through 10 and 22, 1 John 3, 1 through 3, and Matthew 5, 1 through 12. I should maybe point out that if you're looking for a podcast on the text for the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost, you're in luck. We have one of those also. You can find it on the website. But this is for you, uh, this is for you All Saints people. And it's great that the, it's the Matthew text, the Beatitudes, because of course we are going through the year of Matthew and way back when in the spring, I do believe we were talking a bit about how important the Beatitudes might be for setting the tone for Matthew's gospel, especially when you get toward the end of the church year and Matthew gets really difficult, but more on that maybe in weeks ahead. Um, but the Beatitudes, why, why the Beatitudes on All Saints Day? Not why did they pick it, but why would somebody address this, preach on this? Well, I think, the, I, I think the first thing is just the rhetorical impact of the Beatitudes, uh, that to be able to hear or to hear uh, blessed, blessed, however you want to pronounce it, to, to hear that repeatedly over and over again, uh, and, and to imagine that 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 blessedness is yours. Uh, and as Jesus is speaking to, obviously he's speaking to the disciples, uh, but, and it's, and it's going through then the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is instruction about discipleship. And, and then to what extent the, you know, the disciples are then called to, uh, to activate and be active about uh, about what this blessedness looks like, and so to be uh, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. So it's not just a flat out. I don't mean to say that it's a, just a flat out blessing, because I've said in the past some beatitudes are blessing, but they're also a, a call to uh, activity and action in terms of what the uh, what what Jesus imagines the kingdom of God to look like. And that's what, that's the picture that we're getting here. But I do think, uh, again, we talked about this last week of how texts are sounding um, in this time. And, uh, and just the, just the, again, that rhetorical effect of, of blessing and not to mention the fact that uh, it, it, when, when we think about, or at least in you know in my tradition, the various ways in which uh, All Saints gets marked on that Sunday. We're talking last week about ritual, uh, and and how death is itself is going to be differently perceived this year, um, and and what and what that means. And so, I think it's um, I again how you know. How is All Saints going to sound this year in the midst of, of the presence of death like we have not had in our lifetime? Um, and so we have the individual deaths that we have uh, experienced this year, and, and, and nobody has been untouched by the pandemic. But also just the, who knows how many people are we going to be at that point? Uh, you know, a couple of weeks away of the of the global scale of death, and um, and what does it mean then to hear blessed, and what does it mean to uh, to have a day of of remembrance and calling to mind uh, the saints that have gone before us? And so I think it's very, it feels very weighty to me this year, and it feels very heavy, uh, and that's why I just immediately just thought about. Um, how the how 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 those beatitudes would actually feel on my body this year, um, in the midst of all of that. Caroline, I had a similar um, reading uh, this year of this, knowing that um, this is the time when uh, we will re be remembering so many in ways that are uh, is has been untypical 
uh, as we approach this this All Saints. And um, I always love the way Dallas Willard drew, drew attention to uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5 as we number it, um, because in Matthew chapter 4, um, at the end of, of chapter 4, I think beginning probably around verse 23, it says that all the people around Syria had gathered to Jesus because Jesus was healing. Jesus was doing things that brought people to him to experience what Jesus being among them how Jesus being among them transformed their lives. And uh, Dallas Willard pointed out that the words in chapter five, six, seven, and eight, which is that lengthy sermon, come after the actions of Jesus. And uh, that struck for me because all saints is a recognition of the people whose lives have impacted us, that their actions during their life have made dare I say, a blessing in our lives. And, and so it is because of what they've done that we remember them, that we call their name, that we mourn their passing, that we realize we're, we're gonna miss them. But the impact of how they were present um, when we were, um, when we needed comforting, uh, how they fed us when we were hungry, how they uh, lifted our spirits, uh, how, how they were the embodiment of God um, is in, in many ways what Jesus' words um, gave to expression of the experience of what Jesus had done that is recorded in, in chapter 4. And, and if, I, if I lean into this by going back to the book of Isaiah, which isn't one of the readings, but um, this, this recognition also that the parallel of Isaiah 61, um, the mourning, the thirsting for righteousness, are, is right here in how Jesus um, speaks of what it means to be blessed in Matthew. Uh, so the history the past experience, the past presence of people named in the powerful word of a blessing, as you, as you described, Caroline. I really like that take on the text and the day, Joy, I hadn't thought of it before, to, to think of you know, the saints, those who have gone before us, and to pause to, to acknowledge the ways in which they have been Christ to us or to others, the way they've been these mediators of blessing to others. I honestly had not thought of it like that. Um, I think that's a really great way of, of talking about this, of how Jesus' ministry continues now in the lives of others. And, to, and not just talk about, gee, I really miss these people who are no longer with us, but to, to celebrate them, to honor them, uh, to name the presence of Christ in them, in their deeds could be a really powerful um, moment for a lot of communities, a lot of congregations. Absolutely. I was thinking about this. Uh, well, I, if, you know, I would sing for all the saints. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, and, uh, but, uh, you know, the first line of that hymn for all the saints uh, who from their labors rest. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, so this will be the first all saints since my mother died, um, that'll be a year now coming up in the end of November, and looking at this text, and rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. And as you were talking, Joy, I was thinking about uh, when my mom was dying, um, just her, just the way in which she actually was holding together that first line, that first line of that stanza, um, who, who her, her, her labor, she would be resting from her labors and, uh, and her absolute total trust um, in, in, in her reward, not for those labors, but just to trust in that promise of the resurrection. And, uh, and, and so that, that, um, that uh, holding on to that promise too, um, when you think about, uh, when we think about death and when we think about um, uh, those losses that 
that part of what part of what some people, not all people, but part of what my mother modeled to me was uh, this extraordinary faith um, in that in that relationship that I hope I just have nearly that much when I'm I'm there. Um, and maybe I'll have to call on her strength at that time. <laughs> I'm glad you pointed out that word reward. I mean, that's, that's a word that shows up frequently in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's one that a, a lot of us Protestants tend to skip over quickly mm-hmm. and pretend isn't there. Like, uh, but there is this sense of, of reward that's, that's woven through this. And, and mm-hmm. Again, this is a, ser- a sermon that does a lot of things for Jesus. But one of the things it does is, is motivate and and provide a vision of what God's righteousness look like, looks like when it's lived out in the world. And this promise of, of um, I don't want to say repayment, that's not exactly what a reward is, but there is this idea of, of not just, hey, you're done working now, but, but God's gratitude, um, God's acknowledgement of who somebody has been in this world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which in some ways, allow us to make the transition to revelation mm-hmm. um, yeah. um, and I, I you know I, it, Barbara Rossing is a you know a terrific uh, commentator on revelation but I think particularly this is a rerun but of her of one of her commentaries but I think um, one of the one of the most uh, powerful portions of the commentary was the was her last paragraph of who is able to stand uh, mm-hmm. and as she notes that's that's the that's one of the rhetorical features of revelation are the ways in which the sixth and the seventh are interrupted um, when we and when you go through that cycle and so here that it's interruption that's where the that's where this you know this promise of the the multitude and the hundred and forty four thousand uh, is is this in, is this interruption between the sixth and the seventh seal of who will be able to stand and so it's into that it, it that's the question that this portion of the text answers who is able to stand and uh, that God's people can confidently answer with God's help we are able to stand and I think. Uh, you know, two days, at least in, you know, in the United States, two days before our presidential election, that's where I would go. Like who, <laughs> I mean, I'll, I mean, I, maybe not, no, because I would do something more with all saints. But I mean, that's a question you could, like, who is able to stand all of this? Or how have we been able to stand uh, looking back over this year uh, in, in protest and pandemic? And, uh, and, and we we stand with God's help, uh, so that that just like whoa, just, just completely, just really hit me. What what I the, agreeing with you totally, but what also hit me uh, in again this wonderful commentary that she provides uh, was the recognition of the number um, that you know we want to get caught up on the literal number of one hundred and forty four thousand. And she turns our attention to the literal naming of the multitude that cannot be numbered. And uh, so uh, in this moment when we are so polarized, when we are so uh, much sitting trying to figure out who's in and who's out, are you on my team or not, uh, is a recognition that in Christ and with God's help, no matter what, we can stand. And that's our testimony. In Christ and with God's help, no matter what, we can stand. Mm-hmm. I think that is a powerful word that we all need to um, uh, to hold to uh, for those who have been witnesses before us and that those, uh, to steal the line from Steve Green's old song, that those who come behind us will find us to have been faithful. Mm-hmm. I think of this text now, we, you mentioned, we, we, you mentioned at the start, Caroline, so much, so much death worldwide in, in our current context. Uh, and of course, with that, so much grief in, in this context and a lot of delayed grief, a lot of families have been waiting to have memorial services um, in the places or at the scale they want to have them, waiting a long time for these things. Um, psychologists are talking about 
delayed or complicated grief, this idea of what happens when you can't get all your grief out in a quote unquote normal <laughs> space of time and how this is now skyrocketing in communities and among families who, who can't, weren't able to say goodbye the way they wanted to say goodbye because of the pandemic and that. So you have all of this and, and there's a sense of longing in this scene in Revelation. And there's another scene, of course, where the martyrs cry out, you know, how long. And so you do have these, these, this, these longings of when is God going to set things right or, where, or when will our sacrifice be noticed or when, you know, is this all going to end? And the response here at this part in Revelation is praise, which is interesting, right? We sometimes think of lament as the best thing to to lean on when grief won't go away or when we feel stuck or when God seems slow to respond. But what would it look like to move toward praise in a moment like this is a, is a possibility. And of course the praise is followed by this promise of borrowed from Isaiah 25 of no more tears, no more suffering. And it's repeated again at the end of revelation. But I just find that, that interesting that this is the response of these, of these saints in this, in this scene. It's, it's not, they aren't borrowing from a lament psalm necessarily. And the, the psalm there, uh, 34, is I will bless the Lord at all times. And yeah. if, if, if I can be personal uh, as well, um, I've spent a lot of times in, in these last few months very grateful that my mom is not suffering because my mom was in a nursing home. Uh, the last few months of her life. And I'm so grateful that she is not there alone now through this, um, that um, her tears have been wiped away. Uh, and, and I find myself able to praise God for that. And I didn't think I'd ever be able to do that, you know, as I wake up still every day aware of not being able to call my mom. And yet that is followed by, I'm gonna praise God that she isn't seeing the protest, that she isn't worried about being uh, getting the virus, that she isn't concerned. You know, that list goes on and on. So yes, I will bless the Lord. Even now is a testimony for those of us who have this hope. Mm -hmm. Should we go on to anything else about the psalm, or do we want to move to First John? I think Joy said it. The only thing I would add is that it's 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 a psalm about blessing the Lord, but then it also gives a quick character sketch of who God is, which, which is so important in terms of uh, God's good God's goodness, um, God's provision, and so on and so forth. I mean, all these are great. Well, especially Revelation, the Psalm, and First John are such great funeral texts. Um, in, in one way, shape, or form, but they, what makes them good funeral texts is because they speak of God's goodness so well. Mm -hmm. Indeed. I, I had said last week that I was going to spend a whole lot of time talking about who God is, so thank you for reminding me that, that that is exactly the power of this. Always, song. always so we remind you of that. So. <laughs> Well, and then, you know, the connection between the psalm, you know, that the psalm's language of, I sought the Lord, and uh, the Lord answered me, uh, the Lord delivered me, look, I saw it, look, uh, this poor soul cried out and was heard by the Lord, uh, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, all of that, all that really, that embodied language of that relationship, and and then, you know, then the first John, see what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And so there's this lovely connection there between the texts of, of, uh, of thinking, of putting yourself in that position of a child where you, you know, you ask for your, you ask your parents for help and, and, and you know that they're there. You cry out to them and they're there. Uh, and that, that kind of dependence um, and trust uh, that that is being um, that's being articulated in the psalm, and then of course in the first John text, I think is really poignant um, right now to think about. Yeah, think about locating ourselves in that place of utter dependence and then utter trust 
as uh, as uh, as a child would uh, a parent.